<laughs> okay. Okay. Um, thank you for joining us both here in person and via Zoom. Um, presenters today, I'm going to share a little bit of information provided to us by uh, Emma Wagner from Lutheran World Relief. And uh, then Elizabeth Ozelson will be sharing uh, a little bit of her story and of her uh, exchange student story. Uh, and then finally, my daughter Naomi, who's, you can me, uh, will, be, will be joining us from Slovakia and uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Um, Lutheran World Relief. Ah, okay. Here's Lutheran World Relief, and this was provided by this. Can you hear anything? Okay. through a new agency called Lutheran World Relief. The mission quickly expanded. You didn't hear the beginning of that, um, but uh, Lutheran World Relief began its work following the Second World War, when one in five Lutherans in Europe was homeless. And so Lutheran World Relief began as uh, United States churches and Pan-Lutheran, um, so Missouri Synod, as well as at that time ALC, well, ALC wasn't even existing, but the, the various um, uh, Lutheran churches were um, joining together to do international relief. Um, this shows part of the conflict in Ukraine. It's put millions of people in from bomb blasts or flee, flee their homes. Many need medical attention, food, water, and basic sanitation. Civilians have been injured or killed in eastern Ukraine, the capital Kiev, and other areas. People are sheltering underground to escape shelling from heavy artillery, rockets, and airstrikes. In the combat zones, thousands of families have been cut off from water, food, electricity, and fuel for days. Health facilities have sustained damage, and many Ukrainians are in need of medical attention. The United Nations Refugee Agency estimates that more than 3.1 million people have fled to neighboring countries, while more than 1.85 million have been displaced within Ukraine in winter weather. The Polish government has just passed Poland, which allows them to access basic services such as health care, education, and the right to work. 
A lot of refugees is putting pressure on food and other supplies in um, host communities. L Lutheran World Relief has committed uh, over $4 million to into this crisis to increase the amount as they secure additional funds. Pastor in a Lutheran church in uh, Krakow, Poland, that is working to house and help uh, refugees. The humari humanitarian action team from Lutheran World Relief is working with partners to rapidly develop and implement programming based on short and long-term needs. We are deploying additional technical staff to support our relief oper operations in Poland, including a team leader and health specialist. We also are working to expand the humanitarian assistance to reach heavily affected communities and populations in Ukraine. This is provided from Emma Wagner, who's the Lutheran World Relief person, and she's gonna be with us this evening on Zoom. The initial response emergency cash and vouchers for Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Uh, as many fled Ukraine, the currency wasn't always transferable and many had to flee without withdrawing funds. And so uh, Lutheran World Relief is helping to provide some cash and vouchers, which they normally don't do. We've, they've committed uh, $2 million to the cash and voucher effort and support for protection. They're also supporting protection services for refugee women and children who are facing sexual exploitation and abuse. The ongoing support for the Lutheran Church of St. Mount has established a hostel for Ukrainian women and children and we, Lutheran World Relief has provided essential supplies, including milk, energy biscuits, personal hygiene products, room partition panels, and they will continue to support the church to expand relief operations in coordination with Lutheran World Federation. Shipping and distribution of Lutheran World Relief quilts and care kits, which you've probably heard of being assembled in churches um, is in partnership with local organizations. I added this slide um, and just a, a, a note about the, about the, the map. It shows Ukraine, which is the second largest land area country in Europe. Russia is the largest, Ukraine is second. Ukraine has about, is about sixth in Europe in terms of population with about 44 million people. Um, you'll see the little peninsula down at the bottom of Ukraine, that's Crimea, which you've heard about, which was annexed by Russia already, but uh, which is considered part of Ukraine. And then you've got Belarus, north of it, and if you go to the west, Austria and Switzerland are neutral countries, but all the blue countries are and so you see how, how there's, there's that uh, potential shield. Bordering Ukraine, you have Moldova, which is non-aligned, which is in that South, qu south corner of Ukraine, and then Romania to the south, Hungary, Slovakia, and Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia are all bordering uh, Belarus and Ukraine. Okay. Uh, so the crisis in Ukraine and gifts given to Lutheran World Relief are, um, uh, will be used. Um, but just a, a note, I learned this in, in discussion. Lutheran World Relief is an independent uh, international aid organization supported by Lutherans in the United States. 
The mission of Lutheran World Relief is to end poverty, suffering, and injustice, and provide livelihood, sustainable development, and disaster response. Although they started by working in Europe, they haven't had a presence in Europe because of the stability until now again. They're back into Europe and, and working in Poland especially. Um, Lutheran disaster response, which we support, is responding to crisis situations and it's an ELCA organization. Um, and so an example given was that in Nicaragua when there were a, a special, a lot of domestic abuse cases, Lutheran World Relief worked with the government and with systems in place to try to provide sustainable um, programs and opportunities to uh, avoid the domestic abuse. Lutheran, uh, Lutheran disaster response funded congregation in Nicaragua to do education about abuse. S they have different approaches. And Lutheran disaster relief is almost all with um, congregations or local groups. Lutheran World Relief works much more systemically, long-term development. Um, and finally, Lutheran World Federation is a communion of Lutheran churches from around the world. And they, so that's a coalition communion with churches in many parts of the world. All three of these groups are providing some assistance on behalf of Lutherans or in the name of Lutherans <laughs> to uh, Ukrainian people. And in particular, their, their emphasis has probably been with the refugees to this point. Hello, how, and it's good to be here. It's good to see all you guys in person. Um, my goal with my presentation is to just hopefully get you to love Ukraine a little bit. I was a Peace Corps member there in 2003. At that time, we were a group of about 100 volunteers, and we were told we were teaching English. We were told our goal was to help Ukraine join NATO. So this has been something that Ukraine has been working towards for a long time. Um, 2003 is almost 20 years ago. Um, and I just, I want you to feel some love for the Ukrainian people because I'm hoping this thing doesn't continue. But if it continues, Ukraine is gonna need people invested in their country. And I think love would help sustain that interest. So this is our one of a picture of um, Andy and Kati. She was the two-year-old little girl that lived with the host family that we were placed with. In the Peace Corps, you're placed with host families when you initially arrive in the country. So you really get to know people on a very personal level. This is our host family. Um, the um, Valia and Tato, uh, Tato is just, we called him dad, that's how you say dad in Ukrainian, and Dima, um, he was our host brother there. He was 16 at the time and he's kind of grown into this very amazing person and I've had the privilege to kind of follow him thanks to Facebook essentially. Um, he was in the war in 2014 and a lot of Ukrainians consider the start of this war with Russia actually being in 2014. They don't consider this a new war. It's kind of just a war that's been persisting since the initial occupation of Crimea in 2014. We actually had the opportunity to have Dima come stay with us in December because he got a visa somehow. He'd been trying for years. And he talked about the post-traumatic stress that he experienced. He's the most outgoing, extroverted person I know, and he just, he couldn't leave his house after he got back from the war. Um, so right now he's in Philadelphia, actually, and I'm thankful for that, and yet I 
can't imagine how powerless he feels um, to not be in his country. Watching everything happen. Uh, Tato and Natasha, she's in the green. They live in the town that we were uh, stationed at, Reeschiff, and they're still there. And I don't know how things are. Um, every once in a while, Natasha will post something on Facebook. So I think she's alive. <laughs> um, but I don't know what's happening in the village. These are my students. When I was teaching English, um, they were about 10. So t fast forward 20 years, they're 30. They have families, they have careers, they live in Ukraine. I imagine their lives are just completely upheaved by what's going on. And I just remember them as these like super motivated, optimistic kids. And they were so friendly and so giving. So fast forward, 2017, we had this opportunity to host a foreign exchange student from Ukraine. This is Lisa. She came to a couple of services. Um, she lived with us for a year. She's actually from Kiev, and it was I did, terrible. Um, I was, t time change, Facebook messaging her, because I was like, what's going on? And she's like, I don't know. And then she actually called me via Facebook, and she's like, did you hear that sound in the background? And I was like, yeah, I heard it. And that was February 24th. It was the missile. And I was like, oh no, this is real. And then hearing what they have gone through to try and get out of the city, what their contingency plans are. She's 21, so she was in school, she was in college. Her brother is 10. Um, she used to walk him to school every day. Like, he's not in school right now. They ended up going out of the city to, um, it's a village where their grandparents lived. And they have, it's called a dacha, which is essentially almost like a hobby farm. So they keep their potatoes and like they store all their food and have chickens. So it's kind of self-sustainable, but they don't have running water. So they have a well. It's very, it's, it's, it's good in that they'll get what they need. But for a 21 year old to go from Kiev, which is like Minneapolis or New York, even New York's a better example to the village, she's just having a hard time with that transition. But she's so thankful that she's alive. She's trying to keep everything in perspective, but it's a lot. And I just wanted to share a video from her, just so you get a better feel for Ukraine. And actually, I have to stop. It might, just maybe we'll do that at the end. Yeah, we'll do that at the end because we're having some issues with the link. Um, so I was lucky enough to over at the, the Apoteca, where it used to be the Fairview Committee Center, where they actually brought in the, past, the priest from St. Michael's Orthodox Church in northeast Minneapolis. And for those that don't know, there's a big um, Ukrainian community in North Minia northeast Minneapolis, and there's the Ukrainian community, um, community center there. And he was talking about what they're doing as a congregation, coupling with the other two predominantly Ukrainian congregations in uh, Minnesota, and shared how other people can help. Um, on more of a Minnesota level. The Lutheran World Relief, I mean, they can do a ton of things that um, y you can't do unless you have that big presence. But a lot of people want to help in more local ways. And so he gave some um, resources to do that. And these are some links. So Stand with Ukraine, Minnesota. They've been doing um, marches and fundraisers. If you're interested at all, it's a, a good site to go to to learn how to get involved.
with what the Ukrainian community is doing in Minnesota. It's Stand With Ukraine, Minnesota. And then, just escape. Thank you. And then this is the Ukrainian American Community Center website. And they talk about, these are ways um, to get involved. It talks about advocating for Ukraine if you're so moved to call your congressman, talk about talking points when you call them, things like saying uh, the no-fly zone, encouraging that. For the first, I know this is sad, but for the first time in my life, I called my senators and was like, look, I voted for you in every election. I'm just asking for you to please encourage President Biden to enforce the no-fly zone over Ukraine. I think, it's I think it's important that we feel like we can reach out to our representatives. Um, and then I, let's hear from the one other thing you're you are working on a sp specific is there a borscht for for ukraine so when this whole thing went down i was i was like can i do anything i because i just i'm one of those people that i need to do something when something happens i just need to do something so i talked to the teacher that my a foreign exchange student was really close to at roseville high school and we came together and we're gonna have a borscht, bread and borscht dinner on April 8th. We were hoping that the conflict would be over by then, and we started planning this thing in February. Um, yeah, it's not. So February 8th, 4.30, Roseville Area High School, the Commons. You should see what they've done to that school. It's beautiful, like the renovations are just gorgeous. It's worth just taking a look to see what the tax dollars have done. Um, and borscht and bread, And one of the ways that the church here is helping is with some dishes oh, yeah. to, to help out. So you're, you're helping with that as well. Now, I'm not sure how we do this, but I've still got slides here. So I need to keep sharing my screen, but Naomi can talk from, from there. Okay. Hi, can you Hi, hear can me? can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. All right. So, so I'm Naomi Spayholm. Um, I, um, I have been to your church several, several times. times. I'm also hearing, I'm also an, hearing echo. an echo. I don't know if there's a way to turn that off. Turn that off. I'll try again. I'll try again. I'm still hearing, I'm still the, hearing echo, the echo, but, but I can, I can <laughs> maybe turn maybe down turn the down volume on volume my on headphones, my... and that will be a little less distracting for me. Or maybe it's fixed. Okay. Um, so I'm Naomi Spayholm. I'm Steve and Tony's daughter, and um, I am the education coordinator for the Central Europe Teachers Program. We have eight schools in Slovakia and Poland. Seven of them are in Slovakia, and one is in Poland. Um, and I live in, in Bratislava, which is about a five or six hour drive from the Ukrainian border. Um, I want to first say thank you so much for your ongoing support. I know that um, I've heard people have been asking my parents about how we're doing, and I know that you have been supporting us with your prayers and also financially. So thank you so much for that. All right, so let me just tell you a little bit about what it's been like to be in Slovakia, um, a, a country that, that shares um, a, a small stretch of border with Ukraine. Um, I would actually say that the day after the invasion or the day, like the morning um, of the invasion, um, the mood at school and just sort of the mood around town really felt like 9-11, um, where everyone was kind of in shock and didn't want to talk about it right away. You know, everyone kind of knew there was this elephant in the room. And, um, and nobody wanted to talk about it. It just sort of felt like everyone was trying to process everything. And yet you have to sort of jump into action right away. And um, within 
I mean, certainly a couple of days. Um, there were posts, so many posts everywhere. Um, my Facebook feed has has been completely dominated by uh, posts about how to help. Um, Elizabeth talked about how it's great to feel like you can help in local ways. And I guess that's been one of the things that's been great for me is to be able to be here and to see some of the things that people I know are doing. Um, so this is a, a picture of um, one of the border crossings uh, between Slovakia and Ukraine. Um, I know the statistics were shared earlier, but um, it's been about 3.7 million refugees so far. Um, about half of them go to Poland. Uh, there's a much longer stretch of border there. Uh, but as of March 23rd, um, nearly 262,000 people have crossed into Slovakia. Um, and about 50,000 of them are planning to stay. So they have applied for temporary protection here. In fact, uh, the foreign police, um, where I go every year or two to get my residency permit and my work visa, um, was closed to non-Ukrainians for about a month. Um, and now they've just opened up again more generally. Uh, public transportation was free with the Ukrainian passport. Um, uh, one of the the, the oddities of being in the EU, but then sharing a border with, with this country that's not part of the EU at this time, is that um, you, you have roaming fees for cell phones when you cross a border and you can use up 20 years of credit in five minutes. Um, and so that was one of the issues when uh, Ukraines were crossing the border into EU countries is their phones wouldn't work or or they would uh, you know, eat up a lot of credit right away. And so there were at least two phone companies offering free SIM cards. Um, and then uh, my dad mentioned um, having issues with exchanging currency, uh, hryvna, um, and it wasn't exchangeable at first, but I know there are now banks that are starting to exchange um, currency. So um, the next slide shows, um, uh, one of the train stations in Poland. Um, we, we had spring break actually the week after the invasion. And, um, and a lot of our teachers were traveling over spring break. So a couple of them went to Poland and, um, and one took a few photos and shared them on our social media page. Um, so if you're interested in seeing some regular updates, you can follow ELCA CET. Um, on Facebook or on Instagram. And um, so one of the things that she noted is that refugees are not just people, they are also pets. And, and that really hit home for her, I think, that, that many people are, are leaving their lives behind um, and traveling with, with children and with pets as well. Um, all right, you can go to the next slide. Here is um, another train station in Poland, um, just sort of of people. And then she specifically mentioned going down an escalator. Uh, Michelle is, is our teacher who, who wrote this post and just sort of being, feeling like she was in the middle of things and feeling like it was really chaotic. And that is kind of what brought it home to her that, that that's, that's what's going on, you know? Um, so one of the things that I have um, noticed, as I mentioned, my Facebook feed has just been inundated with posts every day about where to donate, what to donate. And it's been very heartening to me to see what kind of a robust response there's been, um, even in a country where the median monthly income is over or is under uh, 13,000, or yeah, sorry, 1,300 euros per month. So that's kind of the median income here. And we've just seen an outpouring of people donating and volunteering time. Um, I'm seeing posts now about schools that are opening up in the area specifically for Ukrainian children. Um, and then, you know, job seekers and also businesses seeking workers have been posting as well. And so people are trying to, to funnel, um, 
I guess, funnel the information to the right people. Um, all right, you can move on to the next slide. Um, here again is one of the train stations where there's just a lot of um, in-kind gifts that have been collected. Um, there were signs at all the train stations saying, you know, come here, um, giving out a lot of a lot of items um, that are needed for travel and also places to stay. Uh, you can move to the next one. Um, here's a donation site that I went to personally. We donated some of our um, some of our baby things that we weren't using anymore. And, um, and this is maybe an eighth of what was there um, in, in Bratislava. It's been overwhelming, um, both the, the number of people in need, but also the number of donations. Um, you hate to say that tragedy brings out the best in people, but it does. All right, we can go to the next slide. Um, here are uh, the next few photos are our highlights from our schools. Um, so I think I mentioned we work with eight schools in Slovakia um, and Poland, and all of them have either uh, collected donations and delivered them to donation sites or delivered them to the border, um, or they have uh, been pointing people toward where they can donate. Um, there's a food pantry at a nearby mall. There are large donation sites at a few spots around Bratislava, as well as a, a warehouse that has been converted to um, a larger scale center uh, with some temporary shelters um, along the borders as well. Um, so um, the, the group that you saw in the last photo is from one of our schools and they went uh, to the border to help specifically, um, <laughs> you can go back now uh, to the this one. Yes, um, so this is the Lutheran Academy in Martin, Slovakia, and um, it, you may know um, that uh, Saint Andrew's Lutheran Church, just down the road in Matamidai, has a strong connection with this school, and they organized um, a forum for Ukrainians to come and just sort of learn where to go for the different things in town. Um, Martin is in central, like northern central Slovakia. It's not, um, it's about 80,000 people, um, which, you know, considering, I, I think it's about the sixth largest city in Slovakia, and they have um, like a large medical center and university there. Um, but yeah, they organized a forum where Ukrainians could come and just sort of get more information about the different um, options for them around town. All right, and then last but not least, this is our, our school in Poland um, with donations um, that they are ready to take where they are needed. Um, yeah, uh, several of our schools have been accepting students from Ukraine. Uh, my school has uh, three new students, um, and this is, you know, in a in a school of about, I want to say, four hundred people. Um, so three new students, and one of the schools in Central Slovakia has uh, six new high schoolers and thirty new elementary or middle schoolers. We've been doing um, a lot of like information giving to the students and also processing. Um, I've been talking to my classes about how they're doing with what's going on, what they've been doing. At, at least a couple of my students said that they were, they had apartments, like they were in the middle of a move and they were going to be offering their apartments to refugees. Um, so it's been very, very touching. Um, but also just overwhelming in general, the number of people who who need help and doing our best to bring some normalcy back into people's lives because um, it's been so disrupted. I know we're running out of time, um, so I want to open it up for questions um, for any of us, actually. So thank you. And maybe if you figured out the video, you can. Yeah, the question is about language for people who are coming from Ukraine. Yeah, well, um, most Ukrainians also speak Russian. 
and there are many Russian speakers in Slovakia. And so it's usually either Russian or English that they are using. We also have, um, at least in Slovakia, there's there's quite a large number of um, Ukrainians here. It's the largest group of non-Slovaks um, in in Slovakia. So there, there are many people who can speak Ukrainian um, and then more who can speak English or Russian. Any other questions? So I, 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 yes, in any conflict, 2014, there was a, a portion of the population within Ukraine that had ties to Russia, family in Russia, lived near the Russian border, Kharkiv, where a lot of the bombing has been happening, one of the harder hit cities, second largest city in Ukraine. They had a lot of pro-Russian sediment what I'm hearing is that that's pretty much gone now that their city has been targeted and bombed. Dima was talking about how they had this huge um, park, uh, bigger than Central Park, he said, more beautiful than Central Park. And the whole country was proud of it. It was one of the big developments. It was one of the first things that was completely targeted and destroyed by the bombing. It's gone. And I just, I, there's, it's, I, I, I would be surprised if there's much pro-Russian sediment after this level of attack. Yeah, definitely not Putin, pro-Putin sediment. Yes. Okay. From your points of view, what is the best help? View what's the best help? It was Emma from Lutheran World Relief. She made the point that um, you know money can be turned into socks if people need socks. Money can be turned into blankets if people need blankets. Money can be turned into food, medicine, and so I really think the way we can help the most is with monetary donations if you're so inclined. And then I really think awareness and prayers and love and support. I really don't want to see this as something Americans can just like say, oh yeah, that's going on over there. Because we had this agreement with when they gave up their nuclear weapons that we would support them if they were attacked. And things kind of changed, and so, like, uh, for some reason, we don't have to be there right now. I don't understand the military, um, but we're not there, and I want us to keep it in our... Yeah. I think the other thing Emma brought up when she was here with some of us on Thursday evening is to be careful in giving. I think the the stand with Ukraine and and the Ukraine Community Center and those are reputable organizations as well as obviously Lutheran World Relief um, ELCA disaster relief um, those are all very reputable and I think you can count on the fact that gifts to those organizations can be effective um, but she she cautioned that as with any crisis there are going to be um, irreputable people who will kind of step in and try to try to make some something that will benefit only themselves may I say something too yeah. um, yes so <laughs> I've I've been working more closely with Lutheran Disaster Response. Um, my supervisor is one of the people responsible for distributing the money, and um, there are. So she's working directly with the bishop of the Lutheran Church in Slovakia, who um, 
can can help funnel the money toward congregations that are hosting refugees. Um, and, and there has been money given to, you know, there are so many congregations that are hosting refugees right now. Um, you know, a, a group from, from my church here went to volunteer to clean at the train station. Um, monetary donations are, are great, you know, uh, Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Disaster Response, those are both places that can, can um, get money to the places that, that need it. Um, I've heard uh, people uh, giving money to Airbnb, like people, people in um, Ukraine uh, who are on Airbnb, and that is not a good option. I would encourage one of the other places to donate because um, Airbnb is a, a large company and they're going to take a cut of whatever, whatever goes through them. Tony. So, um, e yes, there is a, like, is it three million now refugees uh, from Ukraine? And I mean, they have great needs, but there's also 40 million Ukrainians who are still in the country that's electricity, water, all those things are being compromised. And how do we get things into that country? Um, the the priest at St. Michael, they had been putting together medical kits and different kits and through their contacts were able to route it through Romania uh, ports and then uh, I, I, I don't know if it was buses, trains, get it into the country, but it, it's kind of who you know and working through that system to get things moving because it's just so chaotic right now. So if you're, and St. Michael's also taking up money for weapons and things like that. So it, if you're interested in giving that way, that would be, that Stand With Ukraine, Minnesota would be an option as far as sending money towards that effort. Thank you. Do we have time to show that short video? No? Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll show it tonight on the, on, on the Zoom meeting. Yes, Maisie? The basic uh, Lutheran disaster relief or um, or the Lutheran world relief. I think if we if something was designated to either of those, that would that would go through 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 Prince of Peace. So you have not enough, but I've got a handful. Uh, uh, Lutheran World Relief flyers about Ukraine and and some of some of what they've got and they'll be available right by the door um, if you can take one f per family or or thing um, and would like us to close with prayer. We are troubled, O oh God, by the hurting people of this world, especially of Ukraine. We pray for your presence among them, your blessing for them. We ask for safety. We ask for hope. And we pray for help. We also pray, O oh God, for the nations that surround Ukraine that are impacted with the need to provide relief and pray for open hearts. We pray for softened hearts among the aggressors. And we ask, oh God, that you will bring hope and that you will work for peace in our world. Amen. Thank you and hope to see